Well, we're going to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise this morning. What an awesome privilege it is to be able to go into the presence of God. We have access. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood that you shed. You opened the way. You opened the door for us to come boldly to our Father, boldly to the throne. Thank you, Jesus. And so, God, we take advantage of that right now, and we come to you by the blood of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, into your throne, into your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.
give God praise right there in your home, right there in your living room. Praise him right now.
water and wine, I emptied the cup and found myself wanting. But there is a well that never runs dry. The water of life, the blood of the vine. And all I know is everything I have means nothing. Jesus, if you're not my world, everything I need right now, all I need is you right now. There's one thing I Sing that up. I will put my trust.
Sometimes I think we forget that uh, the gospel is the free gift that costs everything. And uh, there's a quote by C.S. Lewis that's a pretty famous quote, and you may have heard it before. But it says, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if true, is of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. It's, there is really no medium middle ground in following Jesus. Um, I think because of the pace that we live at and the culture that we live in, uh, I, I think sometimes we get caught in a trap of wanting to try to fit God in, right? And, and to make him a part of our bigger picture. And I love what that song says. All I know is everything I have means nothing, Jesus, if you're not my one thing. My one thing. My one thing. When Jesus called disciples, which are followers, followers of Jesus, which is another word for Christians, when he called disciples, he said, Leave what you're doing and follow me. And so to follow Jesus meant it was an all-in proposition, you know. I mean, you even see in the Bible where there are people that said, yeah, I'd like to do that, but let me go do this thing first. And Jesus is like, "That's go. you just go do your thing. We're going this way. Following Jesus was an all-in thing. It's all about Jesus. Everything is about Jesus. Jesus. I mean, if you think about it, why are we here, right? What's the reason that we're here? What's our purpose? It's to know Jesus. It's to love Jesus. It's to represent Jesus. And I think it's important to talk about that sometimes because we live in a culture that is constantly competing for our attention, right? It's constantly competing for our focus. There's things all the time, all the time. It's not a simple world that always wants our focus and our attention. We have to have that one thing attitude, that one thing mentality that that song is talking about. David is my favorite uh, person in the Bible. Besides Jesus, of course. And uh, Psalms 84, 2 says this. You can hear, you can hear the attitude of his heart just by reading these words. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. David had a longing to not just know about God, but to know God to experience God. David had an overwhelming desire, a passion to know God. And people who leave a legacy of faith, we're talking about legacy, um, are people whose hearts burn for Jesus. Let me say that again. People who leave a legacy of faith are people whose hearts burn for for Jesus. Now, people who leave a legacy, they can come from a real diverse, varied background, right? I mean, you can have men, 
You can have women, you can have old people, you can have young people, people from different races, people from different backgrounds, many different personalities, styles, and cultures are all different people that leave legacies. We've heard about a lot of them the last few weeks. But one thing that they all share, one thing that they all have in common is their hearts burn for Jesus. Their hearts burn for Jesus. That's a uniting factor right there. You know, at some point, they've reached a threshold. They've stepped across a line where they've come to the realization and said, this is it. This is it. This, this is my why. This is my purpose. This is why I'm here. It's, I don't just want some Jesus. It's all about Jesus. I just want Jesus. I want people to know Jesus. They've, they've gotten to that point. They've crossed that threshold. And these are people who no longer want to give God a slightly bigger piece of their pie. They just take everything and just drop it at his feet and say, God, it's all yours. Everything I have is yours. Everything that I am is yours. And they begin to understand, like Paul did, that their actual life, their whole life, is an actual act of worship. That the life they live, the choices they make, the words they say, is meant to honor God. And they begin to see themselves that way. And their hearts burn for Jesus because he's the source of the fire. Hebrews talks about how God is a consuming fire. We sang about that tonight. And listen to what it says it. Hebrews 12, 28, 29, this is out of the Message Bible. It says, do you see what we've got, an unshakable kingdom, and do you see how thankful we must be? Not only thankful, but brimming with worship, deeply reverent before God. For God is not an indifferent bystander. He's actively cleaning house, torching all that needs to burn, and he won't quit until it's all cleansed. God himself is fire. So let's look at the burning heart of a legacy builder, okay? Number one, burning hearts are refined hearts. Burning hearts are refined hearts. Um, fire, by its nature and in nature, is a cleansing agent. Fire burns up debris. Um, I know this firsthand uh, I'm looking for, there's Mike right there. When we bought our house uh, that where we live right now, the back, at least back acre, had been just left to nature for I don't know how long, and it was just prairie grass, really tall. And Mike came over and helped me with that and cut it all down, and then we just torched it. And it was, uh, I was going to say it's pretty cool, but it was actually pretty hot. Um, <laughs> it got intense there, at least for me, a couple times. But you know what happened when we burned that down? Yeah, it was just a crispy, uh, black, uh, torched out uh, piece of property at that point. But then just after a little while, perfect new dark green grass grew up through that because it had been cleansed, fire had cleansed it. So we could talk about, to take it a little further, a refiner's fire, a refiner's fire. Now gold is refined through fire. Gold is the process that's used, is gold being refined. I think I have a picture of that. There it is. So gold is refined through fire. And what emerges from the fire is the substance that's being sought after. The valuable part is what comes out of the refining process. Um, in other words, the substance that God can work with is what emerges from the refiner's fire. And do you know why the refiner's fire causes the valuable substance to emerge? It's kind of cool. Because heat breaks bonds. Heat breaks bonds. So when gold reaches the melting point, what happens is the impurities that are in unrefined gold separate and rise to the surface where they can be seen, dealt with, and removed. 
You see where we're going with this? A refined fire, a refining fire removes impurities because heat breaks bonds. There may be impurities in your life that have bound themselves to you. But the idea of a refining fire is talked about through the Bible as a way that God purifies us. And so heat breaks those bonds. Impurities are broken off. They come to the surface. That's not always pretty. But they're, they come to the surface where they can be seen, dealt with, and removed. So refining is a process that God uses to equip and prepare us for service. It's a process. Process. And one of my favorite, I mean, I always figure out a way somehow to work this verse in every time I preach. I don't intend to do that, but it just always does. But Romans 12, 2, it's like my favorite verse. It says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Be transformed by the renewing. There's a process that we go through. It's not just like that. And we have to trust the process. So he'll move you through life in a supernatural way, but you have to be a prepared container and a conduit for the glory and the power and the love of God to flow through you. That's why we're being refined. That's why impurities are being removed. That's why we go through a refining fire. And that's why passion or a burning heart precedes promotion. Passion precedes promotion. There is an order, right? God doesn't just pluck you out of your place of indifference or hard-heartedness or immaturity and drop you down into your destiny, and then all of a sudden you start to develop a passion. The passion precedes promotion. Uh, so before you step into a role of serving God, and this is going to apply directly to some of you, because some of you have felt already a call of God on your life. And you know what I'm talking about. But before you step into a role of serving God with your gift or your calling, you will be nearly consumed by the desire to serve God in that way. There will be a season, there will be a period of time where the fire to serve God burns in you. And there's no outlet. And there's no option. And you want so badly to do this thing or serve God in this way or, or be this kind of a person or, you know, the, the cases may vary, but that fire will burn within you before the door opens. It's kind of like if you've ever seen a, been around a wood stove where the fire just keeps getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Eventually you can't touch the stove, uh, but you will lie awake at night and you'll, you'll, you'll lay there and you'll think, if we could just do this, if I could do this thing here, if I, if I just had an opportunity to do this thing, if we could make this one change, a hundred people would come to Jesus over here and you, you will get ideas from God and then your creativity will start spinning and, and go into town. And what happens is, and this is so true, God will allow his idea to mingle with your creativity and a dream will be born of the union. But passion precedes promotion. And so he'll let your heart burn uh, with desire to serve. And at the right moment, the right time, the door will break open and you'll step into it. But not before a fire burns inside to see it come to pass. And it's, listen, it's really important to also understand that in your season of dreaming, you don't just dream, but you do. You don't just dream but you do. So you're not just sitting around saying, if only someday I could do this, if only someday I could have an opportunity to, do, to serve God this way or do this thing. No, you're, you're finding available opportunities to serve. It's, it's like Jesus said in, in Luke. He said, you have to be faithful in little things in order to be faithful in big things. 
So not only does passion precede promotion, practice precedes, precedes position. So while you're dreaming, make sure you're doing. This all ties back in to somebody that has a burning heart. In other words, there is an overwhelming passion inside of you that should be there. But you can't steer a ship that's sitting in the water. There has to be movement. Now, seeing your passion and your calling and and fire to serve God rest in the bigger picture of his kingdom. Being able to see the bigger picture, being able to see the body of Christ is a form of surrender. And burning hearts are surrendered hearts. Burning hearts are surrendered hearts. Somebody who's on fire for Jesus at some point has raised his hands and said, God, you win. I give up. It's your way, not my way. Lord, let your will be done, not my will be done. There's been a point where you've come to an understanding that God sees the path and you don't that God has a better way, that you're thinking about what it says in Proverbs. There's a way that seems right to a man, but it ends, I don't want to go that way, it ends in death. And so there's a, there's a point of surrender. There's a point for every burning heart that has decided to let go of their way and grab on to God's way. And Paul had to have gotten to that point when he made this statement. This is in Philippians 1. 21 through 24. Listen to what Paul says. For to me, living means opportunities for Christ, and dying, well, that's better yet. But if living will give me more opportunities to win people to Christ, then I really don't know which is better, to live or die. Sometimes I want to live, and at other times I don't, for I long to be with Christ. How much happier for me than being here? But the fact is that I can be of more help to you by staying. Now, you understand Paul was not suicidal. Paul was not in depression or despair. Paul, and I hate to say it, but I think this puts Paul in a fairly uh, small category. Paul really, truly understood the goal. I mean, he really saw the finish line. He really understood it. He saw the big picture. He understood the purpose of his life here. He got it. And when he looked ahead and saw what the reward is, it so overwhelmed him. The the promise and the hope of seeing Jesus face to face was so overpowering that there were many times that Paul would say, I just want to be there. I just want to be in that moment. I just want to see him face to face. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about how right now it's like we're seeing through a a cloudy glass, but one day we'll see face to face. And Paul desired that so much, but he also understood, and listen, this is what burning hearts do. He also understood that his life had a purpose here and that his life was a form of worship and that his life here was a way to honor Jesus. And so it wasn't as simple as, well, part of me wants to be in heaven and part of me wants to get stuff done. It wasn't. It was, I love Jesus so much, I want to be with him. But I also love Jesus so much, I want to honor him. And so Paul was torn between these two things, but Paul had a burning heart. And surrender is easier when you see things clearly, like Paul did. When you see that your life totally in the hands of Jesus, is infinitely more fruitful, more fulfilling, more impactful, uh, more loving, more powerful than it is in your hands, then surrender becomes easier. This is a wise quote I actually just read yesterday. But it says this, the farther you go with God, the less you can take with you. The farther you go with God, the less you can take with you. I think equally true, you could say, the farther you go with God, the less you want to take with you. Because the deeper you step in to knowing God, the more he's really all you want to know. 
because you start seeing clearly it's even hard to talk about, right? You start seeing clearly how awesome God is, how incredible his love is, how infinitely indescribable his qualities are. And then you turn around and you look at the things of this world and you're like, why, right? I just want Jesus. And so the farther you go with God, the less you take with you. Uh, another one of my favorite verses, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in, me, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Surrender is the antidote, the antidote, the vaccine. Let's stick with antidote. Of the narcissistic me, self, culture that we live in. It's the antidote. And so burning hearts die to self. They die to self. And that is the culture we live in. <clears throat> I don't think there's any way to argue with that. We take so many pictures of ourselves. we had to invent a word just for that. We had to invent devices that helped us Make, take pictures of ourselves more often, right? Because you guys really want to know what I had for dinner last night. You know, some sociologists say, um, I just read this this week, some, some sociologists are making the claim that we are living in the most narcissistic, self-centered culture of all time. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but I don't think you can argue with the fact that there is an overwhelming focus on self, self-awareness, self-care, self-love, uh, everything self, self-focus. And by the way, this is not something that we can lay at the feet of millennials and Generation Z. This has been around before them. I mean, I don't know how many of you guys were here in 1985. But one of the most popular songs of 1985 said, the greatest love of all is learning to love yourself, right? And that kind of sounds good in some way, right? It, I mean, that's, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, learning to love yourself, that's a good thing. I mean... The greatest love of all is learning. And it sounds good on the surface, but we have to be careful with that. Uh, because it's what our culture says. But it's not what God says. It's just not at all what God says. In fact, it contradicts what he says. Here's what Jesus said. John 15, 13. Jesus said, for the greatest love of all, and he's not quoting Whitney Houston is a love that sacrifices all. And this great love is demonstrated when a person sacrifices his life for his friends. So you see a clear, blatant contradiction. And people aren't singing that song anymore. But the message of that song is still the anthem of our culture that we live in. And so... The most alarming thing to me is when that message creeps into the church and puts on church clothes. Because all through Christian culture, that message has woven itself in to thinking of churches, leaders, authors, pastors, especially songwriters. This idea of self-focus, self-awareness, self-love, learning to love me. But focus on self is not the Jesus way. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 2 says this. Listen to this. But you need to be aware that in the final days, and I do believe we're in the final days, 
the culture of society will become extremely fierce and difficult for the people of God. People will be self-centered lovers of themselves. So, how are we supposed to treat self? Luke 9.22, again, Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So, what Jesus says to do with self is to deny self and follow him. Romans 12.1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. It's like I was saying just a little bit ago, Paul realized that his life actually is his worship. So, there is a place... Where somebody whose heart burns for Jesus, they understand that self-care, self-love, self-focus, self-awareness are not necessary. It's not that you're not important. It's not that you're not precious in the eyes of God. It's not that at all. But you get to a place where you understand that Jesus loves you so much. That Jesus cares about you so much that you don't need to spend your effort caring for yourself, loving yourself, focusing on yourself. You can spend your effort focusing on Jesus. And you listen, if you've ever heard me speak before, you know that I am big on the idea of identity, identity. But you don't learn who you are by focusing on yourself you'll learn a wrong version of you if you do that. You learn who you really are by focusing on Jesus because the more that you do that, listen, this is important, the more you do that, the more you will begin to see yourself as he sees you. And that's the version of yourself I think you want to see. What Jesus sees and what we see when we turn inward and examine ourselves are two different things. I can go back to the story of the prodigal son. I'm not going to do that, but it lays that out pretty clearly. We don't need to put ourself on the throne. Jesus cares about us. Jesus loves us. Let's focus on Jesus. Let's put our attention on Jesus, and we will see ourselves the way he sees us. So people who leave a legacy are people who see beyond themselves. They're not just looking at self. They see beyond themselves. They work for something they never see. They work to bless a generation they'll never see. They realize that the sum of their life is, that their life is greater than the sum of its parts. And as a result, all of this of all of this, burning hearts are ready when Jesus returns. They're living for the return of Jesus. Their focus is on Jesus. Their hearts get excited when they think about the return of Jesus. And I know for a fact, every single person in this room will get to a point where you 100% see this, you 100% agree with it, Yes, it's all about Jesus. Yes, it's not about self. The issue is, will you get to that point in this life or will you get to that realization five minutes after this life is over? When you look back and you come to that same realization that Paul did, that, oh my gosh, my life was supposed to be an act of worship to Jesus. Because at that moment, you are seeing Jesus face to face. You are realizing how overpoweringly beautiful and glorious Jesus is, all you want to do is worship him and love him and glorify him and honor him. And you realize that your life was that thing that was the offering of worship to him. And then if I could just go back and change a couple things to just bring more glory to Jesus. But we can get to that point here. Because we are in what the Bible calls the end times. 
I'm not going to talk about in time stuff. Uh, my stance on that is, if you're not ready, you better get ready. Because Jesus said he's coming back. He said he's coming back soon. Now, I'm going to kind of do some live editing here. I have so much to say. Anybody that's heard me speak before, you know that's true. I just want to be led by the Holy Spirit, which things I need to say and which things I can skip over. I'll just say this to kind of sum this idea up. Jesus said, Jesus said, you're you're going to do greater works than I've done. You're going to do what I've done, and you're going to do greater works than these. He, He said that. It's in the Bible. I have this verse. He also said, um, as he ascended, the very last words that he spoke on this earth, he said, you'll go to Jerusalem and then there you will receive power from on high. And then he also said, it's better that I go because if I go, then the helper will come. And so think about this. Jesus said, it's better that I go because if I go, the helper will come. And and When I go, you go to Jerusalem, and you're going to receive power. And you're going to do everything I did, and you're going to do even greater things than that. Those are the things Jesus said. What would happen if somebody actually took him up on those things? You you realize what Jesus was wanting was he was wanting to have representatives of himself here, doing the same things he did. So if somebody actually said, I believe that, I'm going to act on that, then you would have a representative of Jesus doing the same things Jesus did. What if one person did that? Well, then it would be like Jesus was back walking on the earth, according to what he said, not me. What if two people did that? What if a hundred? What if a million people did that? Do you see how the world would change instantly? People with burning hearts. They are consumed with the idea and the desire of becoming like Jesus to this world. People whose hearts burn for Jesus, they have, they have it down. They, ha- they, they understand this idea that their role is to just reflect the glory of Jesus in this world, to reveal the kingdom of God. So if you don't have a fire burning in your heart, all hope is not lost. You can start a fire. There's a song about that too, but I'm not going to sing it right now. I will, I'll, I'll, I'll quote you this little verse though from Amy Semple McPherson, hymn writer. Let's put it up on the screen. Give me the love that leads the way, the faith that nothing can dismay, the hope no disappointments tire, the passion that'll burn like fire. Let me not sink to be a clod. Make me thy fuel, flame of God. If you do not have a fire burning in your heart for Jesus, the first step is to simply want a fire to burn in your heart for Jesus. I'm not oversimplifying it. The reason I say that is that there are people who are Christians who are totally okay with not pursuing that. It's like, eh, I'm good. I got a lot going on. If you want fire in your heart, There has to be desire to take the first step. There has to be something inside you that says, okay, we're standing here, we're singing this song. All I know is 
Everything I have means nothing. Jesus, if you're not my one thing, and I'm singing that, and I'm like, do I really believe that? Is that really true for me? Oh, God, I, I wish it was true. That's the first step, to just desire it. And then if you want to turn that spark into a flame, the answer is prayer. Prayer. The answer is prayer. What's the answer? It's not a 12-step thing. It's not three points to this. It's prayer. The answer is prayer. Prayer is what the spark that ignites the combustible heart. Prayer is what does it. There's no substitute for prayer. There's no shortcut. You know, what I'm talking about, the kind of heart fire that I'm talking about, is not something that you gain through service or study. And we do need to be at work serving God. I mean, we talked about when, you know, when you're dreaming, make sure you're doing. So we need to do that. But prayer is essential. Prayer is no substitute for work. But at the same time, work is no substitute for prayer. The fire that comes through prayer, it, it, basically what I'm talking about is time with God. So that would include worship. The time that you spend invested in a relationship with God is what fuels and burns a fire inside your heart. The more you know him, the more that fire rages, the more that passion grows to know him even more. In prayer, our hearts are filled. Our eyes are opened. We participate in the process of our minds being renewed and transformed. It cleanses us. It resets us. It molds us. It shapes us. And it causes growth. And also, nothing is more terrifying to the devil than a praying man or a praying woman. Nothing is more terrifying to the devil than a praying man or a praying woman. Prayer is not the preparation for the battle. Prayer is the battle. It is the battle. And it's absolutely essential. You can't do it without prayer. You can't get here without prayer. Nobody who's ever had a burning heart for Jesus got there some other way. It's the one way. It's the bridge that gets you there. So let me have the band come back up. I want to, I've got one more thing I want to just hit real quick. And then I want to give you an opportunity to pray. And I believe tonight that as you pray and as you seek God, I believe that the Holy Spirit is here with us right now, ready to light you on fire for him. I know that's the, I know that's the desire of God. And he's ready to do it. But burning hearts, like all fire, spreads. It spreads. When fire encounters combustible material by its nature, it spreads. You were meant to be an influencer. You were meant to be a propagator. Look, I don't care what your background is. I don't care what your personality is. I don't care if you're an introvert or an extrovert. You were meant to be a carrier of the fire of God. Now, how you propagate that, how you spread that might look different from person to person, but it's what we were all meant to do. You were meant to be a carrier. And in this case, you're not supposed to be an asymptomatic carrier. We all know what that means by now, right? People are going to see symptoms of what's going on inside of you. They just are. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. Fire is a source of light. And your burning heart for Jesus will light the darkness in the part of the world that you touch. It can't be hidden. It can't be concealed. People are going to know. And so as the band plays this song, I want you to pray. I want you to focus in on Jesus. You're welcome to stand. You're welcome to sit. But I want you to have a conversation with God. And I want you 
If you don't feel like there is a fire burning in your heart for Jesus, because we live in a day and a time that that is absolutely essential. And if you don't feel like you have that, I want you to talk to God and I, and I want you to say, God, I want fire in my heart for you. Lord, ignite a passion in my heart for you that burns up everything else so that all that's left is you. Let there be a refining fire. Let me pray for you and then we're going to do this song. Holy Spirit, fall on this place right now. Jesus name blow through this room like a wind when you were sent to this world back on the day of Pentecost fire appeared over the heads of all those people in that upper room And you manifested your presence in the form of fire. And we welcome you right now. We declare our need for you. And for every person in here who is not consumed by your fire, Lord, set their hearts on fire, God. Stir passion up inside of them that overwhelms and overpowers everything else in life that changes perspective, that updates mindsets, that shifts paradigms, Lord God. Let your fire burn in hearts, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Let tonight be a pivot point for many people. So come, Holy Spirit, right now. We welcome you. We ask you to come in Jesus' name. Amen.